I'm going to talk a little bit about um, human rights and the responsibilities or the duties that I think go along with them. And I care a lot about this issue from growing up here in this wonderful community and then going out into the world and seeing um, the challenges and the opportunities that are there and um, being strongly impacted by what I've seen. And I think the core message is that I don't think we can reach the goals of human rights for all that is talked about so much in the way that we've been trying to go about it. And um, so I want to tell you a little bit about how I think we can do it um, from my own experience um, growing up and, and going and working in a place where um, we're far from reaching that goal. So let's start with this idea of of the stories. Um, these are my two homes, my home in West Virginia on the bottom and my home in Haiti on the top. And I would say that we probably all have a strong story about home. It may be positive, it may be negative, but um, we have an idea about home, where it is, who's there, what it means to us, wh why it's home. And um, so these are two obviously really different places, but they're both home to me and they both are part of who I am and um, why, I, why I care about the future of the world and, and the people that are part of these places. Before we get into the, the, real, the real meaning behind this, I want to just touch on the definition. So when I'm talking about rights, it's rights to basic things like water, food, health, peace. And it's also, I'm lumping in things that could be seen more as privileges or entitlements, um, like employment, higher education, things like that. that we can survive without, but that um, certainly many people here in the United States would, would consider as something that they feel entitled to. And on the side of duties, it's moral and legal obligations, and it's from the whole world responsibilities at a global level down to each person and also to the natural world and the world that we live in. This is true. I am pissed off. And I'm pissed off at the story that the world tells itself. Um, because the story that I hear a lot, um, the story that I heard when I first went to college, when I first went out into the world, is a story that is really couched in comforts, in um, disconnection from problems, in um, being so removed that, that it's feels okay to exploit something because we don't really feel the impact that we're having. And the stories that the world tells are largely about rights. And I think rights are easier to talk about. It's like, I deserve this. We want everybody to have, you know, basic things. We want everyone to have a better life. And I think that's great. Um, but it's only one side of the story. And so if we think about, for example, um, story we might hear here is, you know, every American deserves to have cheap fuel, cheap gasoline, so we can drive our cars around, we can live the life that we think um, we deserve as Americans, without really thinking about how does that impact the rest of the world, how does that impact other people and other people's opportunities. And so, um, I think the, the interesting thing about these stories that really piss me off is that we don't even always realize that we're telling them because it part, becomes part of our reality and just part of who we are. It's like, well, of course, this is how things are, when actually a lot of it is wisdom, information, experience that we've amassed that becomes who we are and the stories that we tell. And I do want to be really clear, I'm not angry at Haiti. I'm not pissed off at people here in West Virginia. I'm not pissed off at myself just to single out a group. It's more like, as a collective world, I think we're too far towards looking at, at only the rights part and only what we want to get out of a situation and not so much about um, what we each can and what we each have a responsibility to contribute in order to get there. Um, and I also want to be clear that I'm, I'm not against an ideal that everyone should have water or everyone should have um, a safe place to live or a good education because I think absolutely that's the best ideal we could ever have. Um, it's just a question, I think, of whose responsibility is it to provide that and how do we get there? 
This is my family. This is where I grew up, is right here, outside of Lewisburg. Um, I have five brothers. We grew up on a farm. Um, we ran a construction business together, and there was a real strong idea in the family of um, we're all pulling together. We each have a responsibility to, to help this um, business, this family, work. And I thought for a long time that everyone in the world had a chance like that. Everyone could grow up in um, a nurturing, caring environment where there were opportunities to explore and, um, and to be surrounded by an incredible community like we have here in Lewisburg where there are teachers and mentors and ideas and, and um, creative opportunities. And it's just, it was a wonderful place to grow up and I don't think I could do what I do um, outside in the world without having this place to come back to and to know that it's always here. This is um, the valley in West Virginia where I grew up. And um, I think that the beauty of these mountains um, also brings me a lot of strength and just knowing that there are such incredible people, both people who've been here for decades and generations and um, many, many, many years, and also people who come here and just add to the specialness of it. When I was 16, I said, okay, Greenbrier Valley is fantastic, but what else is out there in the world? Um, so I decided that I needed to go and see a little bit of it. I decided to go to college um, when I was 16, and um, this is what, this is the kind of images, values, discussions, uh, priorities, philosophies that, that hit me pretty hard, and um, it was cruel. Um, the world is not like Lewisburg, it's, uh, it's cruel. And um, it was hard on me. Um, Schoolwork wasn't hard. Uh, the academics, the professors, what was happening at the university wasn't hard, but the peers, the peer pressure, television, um, and just mainstream society was very cruel. And it took me a, about a year and a half to kind of hit rock bottom and say, this is not working for me. I cannot live in this world. This is not, this is not what I grew up to be. And um, in the course of kind of that downhill spiral and trying to figure out um, what was meaningful, I ended up in a very abusive relationship. I was raped by an older student and I developed very severe eating disorders. And it really came to a point of deciding, am I going to live in this world or am I going to create another world to live in or am I going to do something else because this is not working for me. And it was a, it was a tough transition, but I realized that the life that we're each given is an incredible gift and that there are wonderful people, there are wonderful opportunities, and there is a possibility to create an alternative life that is pushing the world toward the ideal that we want, where everyone can have rights and opportunities. And so um, that's what I decided to create for myself. And um, it, it took giving up some of the ideals of society about, well, if I have a, a nice job and a nice car and money and the right friends and whatever, then I'll be happy, right? And I had tried to do that at one point, and it took, even though I knew it wasn't right, it took a real, like, okay, I'm just going to give that up and see what else is out there. And part of what's seeing what else is out there is what took me um, to Haiti five years ago to teach English to about 60 young professionals. Um, and they just became wonderful teachers and friends to me, and we've experienced a lot, including the earthquake, which is a picture here you see from a street in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, from about three and a half years ago. I was there two days before this happened, and I've been there many, many times since with many people from here. The earthquake in Haiti was certainly devastation, trauma, all of that, but it was also an opportunity for Haiti to hit rock bottom and really look at what is our future going to look like, who is responsible for us, and what are we going to do about this situation. I've seen desperation and need in Haiti on a level that I've never experienced anywhere else, certainly not growing up here. And I've wondered a lot as I, as I participate in and, and watch and hear about um, many people with really desperate needs, is it because they've never had a chance 
um, or is it because they've never taken the chances that they've been given? And it's been something that has bugged me for a long time, and I, there's not a simple answer. I've seen many people in Haiti living in, in situations and in, in structures that I would never um, have even considered building as a playhouse as a child or, or even considered that, that it would be possible um, to live in. And um, one of the things that really hits me hard but that also makes me really frustrated in Haiti is when people ask me for things. Children will be like, oh, blam, blam, white person, foreigner, give me one dollar. Why are you asking me? You know, what do you think I'm here for? And why, why are you looking to someone else to fix that for you? And it, it makes me really full of shame for them for feeling like that that's what they, what they can do and what they need to do. Being blonde and um, white in the middle of Haiti is kind of like being a celebrity, and it's not that you ever have to do anything to deserve that or anything, it's just, you're so different and um, get a lot of attention and a lot of people looking at you as if you can do something for them or you can do something in their lives that they, in, in your life, that they can't do. Um, and so it's, it's just a, it's a, been a lesson for me in how it feels to be so separate um, from um, the people that you're, that you're friends with and that you're working with to um, get that attention and be asked things that no one else around here would ever ask me to do, like a mother asking me, well, will you take this child, will you take it home with you and give it a better life, or can you buy me school books that I can't find here? Things that are so, were so outside of my reality before I went there and, and saw the greater situation and how people were living. I've also experienced the um, effects and also the causes of the cholera epidemic in Haiti, which is waterborne disease, and has killed thousands of people and, and made hundreds of thousands of people sick. And it's been fascinating to watch a community in rural Haiti go through the process of trying to figure out um, the root causes, how we're going to prevent this disease, and at the same time, how to care for the people that are sick, and um, try to get to as many entry points as we can for prevention, treatment, education and watch people continue to get sick, even though we're doing all of the things that we, collectively, the community, me, other experts can think to do, and people are still getting sick, and it's like, why is this happening? Why do we have the information, we know what to do, and we have the, the resources, we have the expertise, we have the supplies, and still people are getting sick? These are some of my friends in Haiti, um, my peers, who I respect an incredible amount. Um, they have such a optimism about the future and also a, an incredible faith in um, this, is, this is who we are. We believe that you know, we're Haitian, we're, there's a future for Haiti, um, and they, they have a strong belief that God is with them and that there's something bigger than them that's going to um, help them move forward when they don't see a way on their own, and I, I really respect that about them. These are people in Cité Soleil, in the slum in Port-au-Prince, who've taken it upon themselves to clean up their neighborhood. Cité Soleil is um, notorious for um, trash, for um, not good sanitation system, or complete lack thereof, um, for gangs, for violence, for um, many, many problems layered upon layered. And these people in this neighborhood have taken it upon themselves to do the thing that they can do which is to clean up their neighborhood, paint it with graffiti, and be proud of it, and make it freaking beautiful. And I'm so proud of them, because even though it doesn't fix nearly everything, it changes their whole perspective on what's possible and um, the, their context in which they're living their lives. This is my wonderful friend from Haiti, Snarly Colas, and he had a vision a couple of years ago um, that he needed to help a rural community where many of his friends are from to get a clean water system and to build a primary health care system basically from the ground up, starting with the cholera um, response and slowly growing from there. And I really respect what he did because he is Haitian. He knows people who come from this place. It's right in his backyard. And he's taken it as his responsibility, as 
a Haitian, as someone with privileges, to be able to um, go and do this. And so I've been very proud and honored to walk alongside him as he figures that out. I want to bring this to a conclusion by saying that For me, it's all about the moments that, that, we, that we have. We can decide in every moment, am I going to look at this as what can I get out of it, or am I going to look at it as what can I give to it? How is, how is what I do now going to affect the bigger world? And um, I want to talk to you guys today because I think there are a lot of people in the world and a, including all of nature, that can't stand here today and say something to you about what they need, about what they can contribute. And I think as, um, as people with more power and more voice than many, many people around the world, um, that we can do a lot. And it's a hard road. Um, a lot of what happens in international development is easy. It's a quick fix. It makes us feel good. And it's a lot harder to go and to listen and to try to figure out what is our responsibility? How can I change my life and how, I, how I'm participating to make the world better? And the cool thing is that it's tiring and exhausting and confusing if we do it all the time, but it only takes a moment. And so I'm going to leave you with uh, just a number here where um, there are 7 billion people in the world. We're a lot of people. And if every one of us rewrote wrote one moment of every day, which is a tiny moment, um, that would be over 80,000 moments happening every single second around the world. And I can't imagine that we wouldn't feel the impact of that. And so I would encourage you to consider the vision of that and also consider which second could be yours. Thank you.